Okay, for this lesson, we're going to continue our evidence revolution. We last left off on part one of the of this two part uh, video lesson for evidence revolution. We left off with biogeography, so I'll do a quick recap of that. But uh, to keep this going, this is going to be evidence for evolution part two. I will be referring to a lot of internet examples, so just bear with me when I'm flipping back and forth between the notes here and the actual internet to show you some images and diagrams. All right, so before we get into continued evidences, let's do a recap of biogeography. All right, biogeography is a study of the distribution of species and ecosystems in geographic space and through geologic time, which is the history of the earth and life on earth. So the earth's surface has changed for as long as there has been an earth's surface. Um, you may have heard of Pangea, which is how the earth looked or what the, the supercontinent was at the beginning of the dinosaurs, which was only about 250 million years ago. When you consider that the Earth is 4.4 billion years um, and 250 million years really isn't that long ago in the grand scheme of the entire age of Earth. So I want to flip over, like I said, I was going to, to uh, one of my internet resources. So just bear with me on this. See if I can find it. Give me a second, guys. I have a lot of stuff to show you, so I just need to get it organized, okay? All right, where did I put it? Looking around. Must not have included it, so I'm going to look for it right now. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Google, and I'll share my screen with you momentarily. Just type in biogeography. Let's look at some images here. All right, perfect. Here's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to share my screen, and here we go. Okay, so this is a, a, a representation of how North, or excuse me, South America, Africa, India, Madagascar is wedged in between India and Africa, Antarctica and Australia used to all be together. Uh, we know this, and we know how life was distributed across these land masses by the fossils that have been found in these parts of the world. Now, today, South America and Africa are separated by thousands of miles of, of Atlantic Ocean. India and Antarctica are separated by thousands of miles of the Southern and Indian Ocean combined. You have Australia out there in the middle of nowhere in the Southern Pacific, but we find fossils of animals and plants um, and rock formations and mountains and minerals and elements uh, all across these continents. You find the same fossils of a creature that lived in India. Um, you find those same fossils in, Ant in Antarctica. Antarctica used to actually be tropical. It was not always in the South Pole. It was in a, it was subtropical. It was closer to the equator, but just due to the due to the natural uh, continental drift and plate tectonics of the Earth over millions of years, Earth's shape has been changed continuously. It continues to change, and these life forms got separated once the continents really started to diverge, and they would evolve on their own way. But they have common ancestry. So if you look down here, you have. A uh, prehistoric freshwater reptile like a crocodile. It lived in South America and Africa. Its fossils have been found there. You have a early Triassic mammal-like reptile that lived in South America and Africa. There's a plant species that has been found in South America, Africa, Madagascar, India, Antarctica, and Australia. All different areas of the earth now, but once upon a time, they all used to be connected. 
So this just goes to show us that the face of Earth has been changing for millions of years, billions actually, and the life forms that are present within those life uh, those um, land masses has also been changing. Okay, and that is biogeography. And just a quick shout out of the five pieces of evidence for evolution. This is the one that students tend to forget the most. So you have been warned. Let's move on to number two. We have the fossil record. The fossil record shows all forms, at least forms that we have discovered so far, and variations of life over the eons. So we, there, there are fossils of creatures that are no longer alive. We know that they used to be alive based on their remains. And we can actually find similarities between creatures that are alive today and creatures that have long since been extinct. And there's different time periods. We can find fossils of creatures that have been extinct for maybe a few million years, and we can relate them to creatures that have been extinct for dozens of millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. Remember that complex life on Earth really started to show up about 480 million years ago. Dinosaurs hadn't started until about 250 million years ago. Large animals, mammals actually, didn't really begin to show up in the fossil record till around 30 to 40 million years ago. The fossil record shows a timeline of the evolution of life. I've mentioned once or twice that when I was growing up, I loved dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were so cool. And to think that these big giant monsters actually lived on earth. And then when it, when I found out that they're more closely related to birds, I, I couldn't believe it. When we think of an alligator or a crocodile or an iguana or a Komodo dragon, we think of dinosaurs, but that's actually not accurate. Uh, we know based on fossil evidence that dinosaurs actually are more in common with birds, at least some types of dinosaurs, mainly the two-legged predatory dinosaurs had more in common with birds than they do with reptiles today. You know, that's, that's a thing that's very much spoken about in Jurassic Park. Uh, I want to show you, see if I can pull up another image here from my um, internet. And I found this, this uh, meme, I don't know if it's really a meme. You got an alligator, a tuatara, a Komodo dragon, an iguana. It's a living dinosaur. Actually, it's not. You see all the birds that are below? Those are far more closely related to dinosaurs than reptiles are. It, it is true. So anyway, back to this. Uh, the branch of science, which actually focuses and professes in the study of the remains of ancient life, is called paleontology. In class, some students were saying archaeology. Archaeology is the study of human uh, remains and um, treasures like King Tut's sarcophagus or um, ancient pyramids, um, jewelry, clothes, you know, things that's really more of a human history. Paleontology goes way further back than archaeology does. Paleontology is the study of the remains of prehistoric life. And these remains can be more than just bones. Obviously, we, we know about bones. If you've ever been to a museum, and I'm talking about a legit museum, like the Field Museum in Chicago, the Museum of Natural History in New York City, um, even in here in Tampa, they have some fake skeletons, but they're skeletons nonetheless of dinosaurs at the Museum of Natural History, which is Mosey. We have bones. Um, we have footprints, which are casts where the dinosaur steps in the mud and the mud hardens. It's kind of like when you write your name on concrete and the concrete hardens, it's going to be preserved. There's amber, which is fossilized tree sap. I'll show you some of that. 
Uh, let's see, what else do I have to show you? Um, we have fossilized plants. Um, there might be a few others, but I wanna just focus on these, okay? So I wanna switch over to the internet once again. And I want to show you a, a lot of different images I have here of various fossils, okay? So what you're looking at here are actually dinosaur eggs. And inside are the baby dinosaurs. So we won, we know they came from eggs. Uh, but then that gets us thinking where reptiles come from eggs with shells. Birds come from eggs with shells. Amphibians and fish have eggs, but they don't have shells. So dinosaurs are somewhere in the reptile bird area of evolution. Were they more reptile-like or were they more bird-like? Well, one of the big clues is, are their parents paternal? Most reptiles don't take care of their young. Um, birds do. And when we observe reptiles today, snakes, lizards, and turtles really don't care for their young. The only reptiles that do are just a few snakes do, but mostly crocodilians, which are caimans, crocodiles, gharials, and alligators. They take care of their young, so what, what were dinosaurs? There have been dinosaur nests found with unhatched eggs and hatched eggs with little babies and the parents all in the same area, fossilized. So they all died together. This shows us that there were babies and, and adults in the same nesting area at the same time. That leads, us, that leads us to suspect that dinosaurs were more of a paternal type of creature and that's more bird-like. Here's another um, example. Here's some fossilized plants. They were very similar to how your name is written in the, in the concrete after it hardens. These are plants that were basically left in the mud, the mud hardened and it left an imprint of the actual plant. And you can have more than just plants. You have shells, you have the exoskeletons of creatures. Um, there's a trilobite right here. Those were all over the place in early earth. So these are all ways that we can find how life has changed and compare modern day organisms to organisms that have been extinct for a very long time. Here's something I think you might find really cool. You've likely heard of Megalodon, Carcharodon Megalodon. It's a prehistoric shark. A lot, a lot of scientists agree it looked like a giant great white, but it did not live during the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago. Megalodon was around 40 million years ago. So this is after dinosaurs. This right here is a megalodon tooth wedged into the backbone or vertebrae of an actual whale because these sharks were the size of whales. They were really big. I mean, just think of that. There's a, a whale vertebrae with a megalodon tooth in it. That really tells us what megalodon had on its diet. Here's a, this is a very famous fossil of a protoceratops, which is kind of like a small triceratops without horns, and velociraptor. Now in the Jurassic Park movies, velociraptors are six feet tall. They're not really six feet tall. They're more like three feet tall. Um, this other dinosaur called protoceratops is probably the size of uh, a dog, like a golden retriever. So these two were wrestling with each other and it's believed that they got trapped in the mud or the sand and they sank in the sand and they both died together. And their claws and their beak, their mouth, and everything were just interlocked with each other. And they were preserved that way. So this was a, an amazing find of a herbivore and a carnivore fighting each other. And they both ended up dying, but they were interlocked with each other. Again, fossils. Here's another one. This is a Tyrannosaurus rex that had been discovered with injuries sustained to it. So we have found many, many different species of uh, dinosaurs with wounds and scratches and scars to its bones, which tells us that they would fight, that they would defend themselves, they would be on the attack. We can learn a lot about their, their nature by just looking at their remains. This was a story I, I saw a few weeks ago where there was a 93 million year old, which is about Jurassic period, giant crocodile with a dinosaur in its belly. That's insane. Um, here's the footprints I was mentioning. These are uh, dinosaur footprints. They have found entire herds like herbivores being chased by carnivores and there's footprints everywhere, all over the earth. I believe there's one very famous uh, stretch of land in India or Mongolia, somewhere over in Asia, where there's a lot of herbivores that are all running in the same direction. And on the sides of the herd of the track, there were three-toed predators that were chasing them. 
So these are all footprints, massive footprints, which show, again shows us that these giant prehistoric creatures truly did exist. Okay, I'll get to that later, that, that one there. Um, oh, there is one I think I have to show you guys. Let me look. Here you go. This is amber. Amber is um, fossilized tree sap. And this is a lizard. I think it's 110 million years old. And it's actually trapped in amber. Give me one second. I'm going to answer this phone, okay? Hold on a sec. Okay, I want to show you an, another one that I remember showing my students. This, is, this was discovered about five years ago, and it's 100 million years old. Um, dinosaur tail in amber. So this was a dinosaur tail that was actually discovered in, in preserved tree sap. It was from the Jurassic period. If you look really closely, there's feathers in there. This is an actual dinosaur tail preserved in amber. And this is what they um, suspect the dinosaur actually looked like. It was not that big, but you definitely see some bird-like qualities in, in these creatures. Okay. Just ignore that bell. It's all school today. I'm recording this on my own time. All right, so let's get back to it. Um, remember that fossils belong to creatures that no longer exist. And there's another, um, and uh, evidence within this evidence is the law of superposition. This supports fossils and how old fossils are and how long creatures existed um, eons ago. The law of superposition basically states, these are my own words, older remains are deeper in the earth And newer remains are above them. So if you go home and you have that, that banana peel that you just put in the bottom of the garbage can, and when the a few days later when the garbage bag is filled up to the top, you put that last wrapper on the top of the garbage can, if you were to dig through the garbage, you would still find that banana peel way on the bottom. So this generally states that as you dig deeper into the layers of the earth, you're actually going to find older life forms. So if you did this with um, all the various forms of life that there has been, if you start in the very bottom, you would find the first life forms ever, which were bacteria. Bacteria are going to be prokaryotes. We actually have fossilized prokaryotes. The next layer over that would be the first eukaryotes. And then we're going to have the first multicellular life. When I said first eukaryotes, you might think they're multicellular. There are single cell organisms that are um, eukaryotes, but these multicellular organisms are eukaryotes too. Then you're going to have invertebrates, things that are not really that cool, but you got to get to these early stages. We're talking worms, jellyfish, sponges, sea cucumbers, you know, stuff that may, you may not think is really cool, but again, it has to start, start somewhere. Then we have arthropods, which are going to be invertebrates with armor, um, crustaceans, arachnids, insects, scorpions, crabs, lobsters, giant bugs. Then you finally get the vertebrates, fish. These are the first vertebrates. After that, we have amphibians. Now we're out of the oceans. Then amphibians gave rise to reptiles. And then we have a lot of divergence here. After reptiles, you have creatures called mammal-like reptiles. These are before the dinosaurs. We know this because when we dig in the strata, the mammal-like reptile fossils are below the dinosaur fossils. Next, we have dinosaurs and early mammals. We're talking really small. Mammals cannot really make it big because the dinosaurs were on Earth. Then we have birds and large mammals. And that's where we are today. Mammals are the dominant type of creature on this earth. And it would not have happened if it wasn't for dinosaurs 
uh, taking over. So when we look at the fossil record, I want to kind of highlight dinosaurs for an example. Below here, no dinosaurs. Above here, no dinosaurs. Right in here, dinosaurs. So it, the fossil record truly shows us when creatures showed up, when they existed, and then when they were uh, eradicated or extinct. Now, throughout the history of Earth, there have been five mass extinctions. Scientists actually uh, agree that we're currently in the sixth. And the five mass extinctions we know happen. When you look in the layers, and there are layers with more than the usual number of fossils. So if, if I was digging in, an, in a layer and there were far more fossils than there should be, for instance, if I'm digging deep, there's fossils, fossils, digging deeper, there's some fossils, I can get to one specific layer and it's lots of fossils. That can indicate a mass extinction. In, in all the study of the digging of the earth and digging through the strata, there have been five layers with huge amounts of fossils. And the extinctions are really indicated here. I'm gonna highlight them right here. Uh, let's see, we have, no, that's not the first one, excuse me. Uh, the first one's gonna be here. There's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. The fourth one happened during the dinosaurs. Then the fifth and most recent one was the one that ended the dinosaurs. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Number three is the worst. It was called the great dying. 96% of life was wiped out. And this is the extinction that actually allowed dinosaurs to exist. And that gets me to my next point. When there is a mass extinction, Creatures go, a lot of creatures get wiped out, especially the big ones. And every creature on earth has its role to play. It's called this ecological niche. Some people pronounce it as niche, niche. I don't care how you say it. But a niche, I pronounce it like that, is an organism, or excuse me, an organism's role. The role an organism plays in a community. Now, this is very important for you guys to understand for AP Bio. When there is a mass extinction, there's a lot of niches that get opened up. When there is an extinction, many forms of life um, are exterminated. This is called an extinction. Now, if every teacher at Plain High School got fired, you know, like, let's say we're all stealing milk from the cafeteria. We all get fired. Oh, no, that's really horrible for us. But it also serves as a great opportunity for new teachers to come to plant and fill our spot. So when there's a mass extinction, it's really unfortunate for the creatures alive and dominant at the time. But it provides an opportunity for new creatures to take their place because there's open niches. This results in open niches that forms of life can now occupy. So if there was some kid at USF that just graduated college and wants to be a teacher and Mr. Thorson loses his job as AP bio and anatomy, this new kid can come in and fill, fill my spot. So it's unfortunate for me, my niche is then going to be open. It's like a job vacancy and a new participant can fill in that void and change the classroom however he or she sees fit. All right, uh, I wanna comment a little bit about the dinosaur extinction. Other evidence for that. It was once hypothesized, was it a major flood? Was it volcanoes? How did they go extinct? We know it was an asteroid. Here's how we know. One, there's a crater for this asteroid in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, not too far from Florida. If it happened in Florida, you would definitely, if you were living in Florida at the time, you would definitely see this explosion over in, the, um, in Mexico. Number two, there's a layer of iridium. 
in Earth's crust. And this layer of iridium is 65 million years old. MYO, million years old. Iridium is an element on the periodic table. I think it's number 77. Let me check real quick. Yep. And it's only found in asteroids. It doesn't naturally occur on Earth like iron and copper and nickel do. If you go into the Earth's strata and you dig down to the layer that represents about 65 million years, you're going to get um, this layer of iridium right here. So what could have actually hit the Earth, Earth hard enough and more and impactful en enough to leave a layer of iridium, especially near Central America? Something from space, an asteroid. And that's another huge piece of evidence we have. And another thing to kind of piggyback on that is that there are no dinosaur fossils after that layer of iridium. No dinosaurs above the iridium layer. So dinosaurs were not, they did not exist. Then they did, and then they didn't. They went extinct. All right, next we have transition fossils. Transition fossils show how species evolved over time. We kind of call them the missing link. And there's two that I want to show you. The first one was discovered during your lifetimes uh, for most of you, Tiktaalik rosea. This was discovered in 2006. This is the missing link between fish and amphibians. It was discovered in Northern Canada. It's so, it was such a famous discovery back then that they actually put it on their money. There's coins in Canada that have Tiktaalik on it. So let's see if I can find Tiktaalik. There it is. This is a missing link that was discovered in 2006 between fish and amphibians. It has fish qualities and amphibian qualities. It has eyes on the top of its head. Fish don't have those. Amphibians do. It had jaws. It had uh, large, powerful, or not large, powerful, but it had strong enough forelimbs to lift itself out of the water. And it didn't really have gills. It had lungs that breathe through its mouth and nose. That, again, is an amphibian quality, not fish. So this is what we would call a missing link between the fish creatures and the amphibian-like creatures. This was way before the dinosaurs. And this just goes to show you that discoveries are made all the time. I was born in the 80s. This was not found. This was found during your lifetimes in 2006. So there are discoveries being made every day. Another transition species that was discovered a long time ago, I think it was 1851, is called Archaeopteryx. It means ancient flyer. Discovered in 1851 in Germany, I believe. This is a transition between dinosaurs and birds. This was about the size of a crow, so it's not that big. But if you take a look, that is Archaeopteryx. You can see it has lizard-like or dinosaur qualities, has a long tail, has claws, has the same bones you do. Femur, tibia, fibula, humerus, radius, ulna, vertebrae, ribs, pelvis, skull, all those things. But if you look closely, you can see the imprint of the wings. This thing um, is believed to have um, fallen out of a tree and it landed in the mud. The mud hardened and it preserved its skeleton very well. And you can actually see the imprint of the feathers from its tail, its legs, and its wings in the mud. Very amazing find back in 1851. This was one of the first times that uh, birds were found in the fossil record in the same area with dinosaurs. So it goes to show that um, dinosaurs, some did evolve into birds. And by the way, if you think pterodactyls like this evolved into birds, that is incorrect. That did not happen. It was actually these guys. Mostly the two-legged carnivore dinosaurs. Sorry for the horrible fast drawing. They were covered in feathers. A lot of scientists were a little peeved when Jurassic Park came out and the raptors were not covered in feathers, but the director didn't want to have feathers. He didn't think it looked scary. But nonetheless, that's what dinosaurs actually look like, especially the, the predatory two-legged dinosaurs. Okay. 
moving on because I'm going against the clock here. Number three, comparative anatomy. Comparative anatomy is also called homology. You see the word homo in there. This is the study of characteristics that show common origin or common ancestry. There's a reason why humans have a a femur, a tibia, a fibula, humerus, radius, ulna, spine, ribs, sternum, all those body parts. And that's just bones. I could get in organs too, but so do crocodiles, turtles, um, all of the birds, reptiles, amphibians. We all have a lot of the same structures because we have a common ancestor. First, we have homologous structures, and that is pronounced homologous. Homologous structures are common features in different species. So to show you this, I have a great uh, diagram for you. What you're looking at here is the forelimb of a human, a dog, a bird, and a whale. The top, the, the light brown, that's the humerus. The red is the ulna. The cream color is the radius. The yellow is the carpals. The brown is the metacarpals and the phalanges. We all have the same bones. They're adapted for specific types of life, whether it's walking or flying or swimming or have free hands like humans do. We walk on two legs, not four, but we all have the same structures, the same bones, which means that we share a common ancestor. All of us share a common ancestor um, if you go back in time far enough. Okay. The opposite of homologous structures are analogous structures. Analogous structures are structures that have a common purpose, but evolved differently. I have legs, so does a grasshopper. My, but my legs have muscles and nerves and bone and cartilage and tendons and ligaments. A grasshopper's leg really doesn't. So if you look at a human, humans have legs, but again, so does a grasshopper. They're meant for the same purpose, but they evolved differently. Another example could be a butterfly. A butterfly has wings. a horrible tail and so does a bird but a bird has a spine and ribs and shoulders and arm bones and a skull butterflies don't have those but they both have wings so analogous structures are structures that have the same purpose but they evolved differently and then lastly we have vestigial structures vestigial structures are going to be homologous structures that no longer uh, serve a purpose. Your human appendix is a vestigial structure. The hip bones in a whale, whales have hip bones. They used to walk on land. That, those are vestigial structures. Humans have a third eyelid. Some people have an extra tendon in their arm for when we used to live in the trees. Those are structures that once had a purpose, but no longer do. They're a remnant of a former, of a formerly needed body part. All right, evidence number four, comparative embryology. Almost done. This is a day off of school, they're trying to get me out of here. Comparative embryology is a comparison of the early developmental stages of different species.
So here is another example. Take a look at this. That is a dolphin. It looks just like us. If you look at these early stages of embryonic development, which one is the human? It's hard to tell, isn't it? They're all vertebrates. But then as I start to scroll down, you get to be down to the fetal stage. Then you start to see you got fish, uh, amphibian, turtle, which is reptile, bird, which is reptile. And then it looks like we have a pig, a cow, a sheep, and a human. Very similar development, developmentally because all vertebrates, creatures with a spine, have a common ancestor. So if I showed you this and I asked you which one's a human, if you got it wrong, you would not be blamed for getting it wrong. Very, very tough. So this just shows us, again, that all vertebrates um, have a common ancestor. In fact, all life has a common ancestor. You guys have a common ancestor with an octopus if you go back far enough in time. And finally, number five, we have molecular homology. This is the newest uh, evidence. All forms of life have the same DNA structure. We all have ATCG, a human, a cauliflower, an octopus, a redwood tree, all of it. However, the more common DNA is between life forms, the more closely related they are. They have a more recent common ancestor. You have more DNA in common with an ape than you do with a rattlesnake. If you say, I didn't come from a chimpanzee, you're absolutely right. Here's a chimp, here's a human, common ancestor. All right, that is all.